Okay, my wonderful students, let's get going uh, with lecture today. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, that's the main thing. And the target of all that is really the third law, which is useful for us in almost every astronomical system that we can see, we can use Kepler's third law. Uh, any kind of a double star system, Actually, galaxies probably, I, I'm supposed, I suppose somebody's probably used it with galaxies. Kepler was an interesting guy. He was from uh, Austria, Germany area, uh, Johannes Kepler. We find, therefore, under this orderly arrangement of planets and orbits, a wonderful symmetry in the universe and a definite uh, relation of harmony uh, in the motion and magnitude of the orbs, in other words, the planets, of a kind that is not possible to, to obtain in any other way. Now, what he was talking about there was the stuff that we're going to talk about today in his laws of motion. And last time we talked about this particular comet, Hartley 2, and the different spectra and what they looked like uh, in a real research paper, a real astronomical paper, uh, and how they identify the different things that are uh, in the comet and stuff that's boiling off the surface, as you can see in this image. Uh, another thing that we had was some homework uh, on Spectra Chapter 5 in MasteringAstronomy.com. I want to go over this one with you a little bit. There were some errors on this one. Uh, some of you took this particular question, uh, which was to rank the colors of visible light from left to right based on the altitude uh, where they're fully absorbed. And a lot of students uh, just racked them up this way. From red uh, on the left, uh, highest altitude, to uh, blue on the right. And that is incorrect. Uh, some of you got it correct on the first one. The real idea is that if we can see any color here on the surface, I mean, we're basically at sea level, right? And I could see, well, we're in the room here. But if you're outside in the sunlight and you can see any colors whatsoever, that means that those colors make it to sea level from the SUN. And so really what you had to have on that particular problem uh, was a stack. And this, I really like these ranking tasks. I give them a lot in homework. This is not the last one you're going to see. And I wager to say you're going to see uh, bunches of these uh, for different concepts, not just for atmospheric absorption, but for all kinds of things. And they work really nicely. And sometimes you got to stack things. If they're equal, you stack them together, you know, one on top of each other, just like that. Uh, and uh, I figured out in MasteringAstronomy.com, they have a couple new uh, features in it. And it lets me see where you guys make errors, actually. So I know that a lot of people made that error that I just mentioned ago, a minute ago. Uh, and so uh, I'll try to do that to start class uh, when it's necessary. So... Um, and one thing that's necessary is for some of you uh, to figure out you're kind of puzzled like this little hound dog here, I'm trying to figure out masteringastronomy.com. Uh, and for those of you that tried to register, here's what Evelyn uh, Nimi, ooh, I spelled her last name wrong. Uh, Evelyn Nemi uh, wrote me uh, last night. I'm working through student emails. I have about seven. The problem in most cases, they bought the cosmic perspective, not the essential cosmic perspective. Now, I see somebody up here in the front checking the front of this book. Here's what the covers look like. Fellas, do you need seats? Sit anywhere. Just come down the front. I don't mind. Just make yourselves at home. Uh, here's what they look like. This is the one you want. Is that what yours looks like? No? Oh, 
if you got the UCF, ver that's the UCF version, right? Hold that up so that people behind you can see that. This is what the UCF, uh, that's the loose leaf, right? Yeah. Yeah. The loose leaf, it's, but it says essential on the front of it. Okay. It looks a little different. This is the paper bound version. If you have that, here's the full scale cosmic perspective. So you don't want that one. You want this one. Uh, and you don't want this one over here. All right. Question. She will, and, and in discussions, I posted her email address, and just go, and I think I did it in lecture um, Tuesday as well. Just email her, and I think, hey, uh, who emailed her with the problem and got it squared away? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a few people that have done it, so email her. And Was it easy? All right, yeah. So she'll give you an access code, and just go. Yeah, I'll be doing some extensions on that stuff, you know. So we got to get you guys, you know, 250 students in here. You know, we got to try to get everybody through that gate, and uh, we'll do it. Um, any questions about lovelymasteringastronomy.com? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, I set up a new page in web courses I want to go over with you. And this page, it's called Extra Readings. And it'll have a variety of uh, supplementary information. You know, like maybe a little biographical info about Kepler or whatever, I've, or Galileo or somebody important like that. Um, it's for stuff that's not in textbook or mastering astronomy.com. Fellas? Fellas? Yo, with a hat. I could hear you when you're talking like that. If you're distracting me, you're distracting people around you. Okay? The acoustics in here are really good. All right? So try not to, try not to talk over the top of me. Okay? Good. Uh, so if it's not in a uh, in textbook but we discuss it, or if it supports something that we discuss in lecture, uh, it'll be on that page. And right now I've got a blurb in there with uh, three YouTubes that are kind of nice uh, about how to draw ellipses. And uh, similar to what you have in the book, but they actually do it uh, in a video on YouTube. So you can see what the book says, but then you can actually, in these three YouTubes, and there's zillions of YouTubes uh, of how to draw an ellipse with string and thumbtacks and stuff. Um, and then for those of you that want to dig a little bit deeper into the math, there's, it's like an endless supply of math. It's a big, huge mountain of mathematics. Uh, I put a link into uh, the ellipses page in Math World, which is one of the better math pages. Anyways, the extra readings page right now, it looks like this. And there's, th there's the, what the three YouTubes look like. Those definitely anybody can look at. You can mess around with that. And then down below, right here, is the link for uh, uh, the ellipsis page on Math World. Questions about that? Uh, raise your hand if you're an elementary or secondary education major. Okay. A couple ed majors. The rest of you, you may be going, you may become famous someday and have to give a public talk. I see a, a young lady in the middle going, Dr. B, no, that's not me. But you might, you never know. I mean, you might win the lottery sometime and become famous. And if you do, when you give a speech, when you give a talk, especially in a big group like this, and you're asking for questions, you'll do what I've been, do been doing today and what I do in almost every lecture. I ask you, do you have any questions?
<laughs> I wait 15 seconds. And usually, if there is a question, students will raise their hand. If they don't, you know, they don't. And sometimes somebody will blab out some wise remark like the last guy. Anyway, that's called the 15 second rule. I learned it when I was a grad student. You ed, t ed majors, you may need it. The rest of you that become famous, you know, you run for president, you may need it. Uh, although if you're a politician, it's usually the other way around. Politicians don't usually listen a whole lot at, for questions, but that's the way it is sometimes, I guess. Anyways, let's get back to Kepler's three laws, and I'll use the 15-second rule a few times more this, uh, this hour. Uh, here's a picture of Kepler from the textbook. Uh, we're going to do some clicking, so get your calculator and your clicker ready, if you haven't already. And we're going to operate on frequency AA, I guess, for the rest of the semester. That's good. As I mentioned last time, Kepler was a junior assistant to Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe was the Danish uh, astronomer that made extremely precise uh, observations of the planets. Uh, and basically what he did was he had a really good protractor uh, and lots of assistance, lots of ability to write and keep records. Uh, and Kepler was his junior assistant. And Tycho Brahe was convinced that the planets moved on circles, but he thought that they circled the sun and that the sun circled Earth. He just didn't feel comfortable with everything orbiting the sun. And uh, for you know a bunch of reasons, I, I suppose he's probably uh, written down what his reasons were. Uh, but he, he wanted Kepler to figure out the planetary, the orbs, the motion of the orbs, the celestial orbs uh, in the universe. And Kepler was a, a genius. I mean, he had all that data and he figured out these three laws of planetary motion. And what he had... And they have a quote from your textbook. It's, it's pretty interesting. He was looking at the, the orbits that the different planets would have if they were perfect circles. And he just couldn't get them to work out right. And this is about um, a little error or discrepancy of eight minutes of arc. And he said this, if I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes of arc, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly and ignored them. But since it was not permissible to ignore, those eight minutes pointed the road to a complete reformation in astronomy. And it's called the Copernican Revolution. It's the one in which we finally established that the Earth is a planet orbiting the sun. There's a big, huge controversy about that uh, from the days of Copernicus to the days of Galileo and Kepler and on up to the days of Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, when he mentions reformation, that's exactly uh, what he meant. It's a huge change. Now, vocabulary. What is a degree? What is a minute? What is a second of arc? Better take some notes. Also, what is parallax? We'll talk about that. Okay, everybody knows that one full circle is 360 degrees. And that is basically a counting system that traces... Come on down, have a seat anywhere you like. Don't, don't feel bashful. You don't have to stand back by the door. Unless you want. You're certainly welcome to sit wherever you like. You can sit up here in this fancy boss chair in the front row if you like. Don't, don't feel bashful. Uh, so the ancient Sumerians back in Mesopotamia, you know, you know, they're going around. They're fi they were the ones that figured out, you know, the zodiac, and they divided up into twelve regions. Um, and their counting system was based on six, twelve, sixty, and so on. And three hundred sixty traces back to that. Uh, now, one full degree can be subdivided 
into 60 minutes of arc. Okay? And so a minute of arc is a 60th of a degree. Now, a degree is pretty slivery to start with. But if, you're, if you have a big enough circle, dividing a degree into 60 equal pieces, it's, you could do it. And that's what... Uh, uh, Tycho Brahe was able to do the full moon about 30 arc minutes about half a degree whether it's on the horizon or whether it's straight overhead or if it's on the other horizon it's about half a degree and as I mentioned the Andromeda galaxy is about the same size although we can't see it we don't get as much light per second from the Andromeda galaxy as we do from the moon of course uh, but the moon is about 30 arc minutes. Uh, your vision has a resolution of about one arc minute, supposedly. Although if you have really good eyes, uh, maybe a little bit less than that. You can see even more fine detail. Uh, back uh, when I first bought my camera, I have a 35 millimeter camera, and... I was talking to some guys about buying a lens and it came, it was a Yashica 35 millimeter SLR. And back in the days when we used film, black and white and color film, Kodachrome and all that. And it came with a nice lens and it was pretty good, the Yashica lens. But it was a camera that could take a, the uh, Carl Zeiss lens from Germany and those were the best. You know, the, the astronauts on the moon, you know, the NASA astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, their cameras had Carl Zeiss lenses on them because they're the best. And it was explained to me that the difference is when you take a picture with a regular lens versus a Carl Zeiss lens, the Carl Zeiss lens can see, can, can photograph every little twig on every tree half a mile away, you know, on the other side of the lake or whatever you're uh, photographing, very, very fine resolution. And same as our great astronomical telescopes. You know, they have very, very fine resolution. Uh, for us, it's about an arc minute, okay, our lens system. What is an arc minute? Well, if you divide that up, as you might expect, uh, you can divide it up equally into 60 parts, and those are called arc seconds, right? And an arc second is a 60th of a minute, so a 3600th of a degree. And I don't even know what that is, a fraction of a circle. I mean, 360 times 3600, it's a pretty tiny fraction of a circle, full circle. Now, I'm going to talk about this second word, parallax, P-A-R-A-L-L-A-X. And what I want you to do is to focus uh, and, look and eyeball that clock or maybe the American flag. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to look at that exit sign over the back door there. And what I want you to do is to hold your hand in front of you and, you know, put your thumb up and cover the clock with your thumb. Close one eye, okay, and cover the clock with your thumb. And I'm covering the exit sign. All right, now your thumb is out there. Now you've got one eye closed and one eye open. All right, and it's covering. Now, open the other eye and close the first eye. And what you'll see is the, the clock or the flag that you're looking at, in my case, the exit sign, moves to the left or to the right. Okay, that's parallax. And the, the change in the angle is called the parallax angle. Okay, so when I look at that exit sign with one eye open, I'm looking in a certain direction, and then relative to my arm when I open the other eye, it's tilted up just a few degrees, in this case, to the right. Okay, that degree, that change in apparent angle is because of the baseline distance between my two eyeballs. So an inch or so, a couple inches maybe, okay, depending on how... Yeah, depending on... No, don't move your arm. Keep your arm set. Yeah, and then just open. 
Now, parallax, the distance between your two eyes is what achieves parallax in a case like that. If something is really, here's another, here's, let's just try one more thing. Do a parallax test for somebody, the back of somebody's head, a couple rows in front of you. And what's your name up here? Alaric. Alaric? I'm going to do it for Alaric's face. And so do it for some the back of somebody's head. Okay? And, and if you do that, you'll notice the angle is different. It's a little bit bigger. Okay? That's because the person that you're looking at is so much closer. Okay, so the, if you're really far away, go ahead and make a note. Parallax, for, for medium distance, noticeable. For really far distance, it gets smaller and smaller. Okay, so for close to medium, it's noticeable, the parallax apparent swing angle. But the further away you get, the smaller it gets. In astronomy class, an astronomer, if Galileo and Copernicus were right, we should be able to look at the stars in January, January 21st, and then on June 21st, six months later, and, uh, wait a minute, two, three, four, five, six, seven, July 21st, six months later, and the star should, you know, parallax left or right, okay, we, you know, if it's really true that the earth is orbiting the sun, now if the earth, like Aristotle said, was fixed in place, and everything orbits around it, you know, we're never going to pick up any parallax. But if, it, if, if Earth is really changing, if the baseline is not an inch and a half between your eyes, but 186 million miles from one side of the Earth's orbit to the other, you should be able to pick up a little bit of parallax with planets or with stars. Aristotle was said, you guys cannot be right. Earth cannot be orbiting the sun because we do not observe any parallax. Aristotle didn't observe any. Tycho Brahe tried and could not measure any parallax. Galileo couldn't. Sir Isaac Newton could not. But in the 1800s, we did. All right Now, parallax angle. One second of parallax for Earth's orbit means that the thing that you're looking at, you know, if you get, you know, for us, we're here in the classroom, we're, we're getting, you know, four or five degrees, maybe 10 degrees of parallax. If you get a one second of parallax, that means that the star you're looking at is about 3.26 light years away from you. Now that's pretty close to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Okay, that's about uh, three light years and change distance. Okay, every, all the other stars are further away from that, so every other star has a very, very small parallax angle that we can measure from Earth orbit. Now if we were on Jupiter's orbit, quite a bit bigger than Earth's, you know, so here's the baseline for eyeballs, 186 million miles for, uh, for Earth, for that baseline. Jupiter's baseline, we'd be able to see way, way fur further out and triangulate to get parallax distances. Question? What I mean by one second of parallax is if you close one eye and open one eye, the apparent angular shift relative to your arm. See, my arm doesn't move, but you appear to move. I'm doing you right now. I'm doing parallax on your face, and you seem to be moving left to right. You're not really, 
but you seem to be, and that angle, you know, so if like from, 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 from right here along this line, you know, shifting left to right, that's an angle, and that's the parallax angle. So, you know, and for you, it's about, I don't know, five or six degrees maybe. For a star, one second even, or even smaller. Okay, the closest star is about one second of, uh, of arc, okay? Students, this distance is also called a parsec. Go ahead and write that down. P-A-R-S-E-C. So if you, if you get some parallax and you measure it, you can get the distance, and the distance uh, that corresponds with one, min one second is a parsec, or 3.26 light years. So some astronomers work in light years, some in parsecs. You see both. The symbol for parsec is PC. It means parallax second parsec. Now the first guy that ever measured stellar parallax uh, was uh, Friedrich Bessel. And very famous guy. He's a physicist, an astronomer, and mathematician. Uh, and about 150 years ago, in the middle 1800s, is when they were able to first measure that for the star 61 Cygni. Uh, star number 61 in the... Uh, these guys... Bugging me. Uh, star number 61 in the summer constellation Cygnus. Okay, and he, so we figured out, okay, so many uh, fraction, a certain fraction of a parsec, about 10.4 light years, LY. LY is a light year. So he was the first guy to, to, to actually measure it. So Aristotle was looking for it, didn't find it. Copernicus, he didn't get it. They knew what to look for. They knew to look for parallax. If they could find parallax, that would nail down the Earth as being in orbit around the SUN. But they just couldn't. It was so small, they could, and they didn't have good enough protractors, um, they couldn't get it until uh, Bessel. And they had to have really good telescopes that didn't blur or anything like that. And it was quite a while. And s since then, you know, we've got spacecraft up in orbit that are uh, measuring, you know, way, way far out uh, in terms of parallax, you know, up above the atmosphere. Very, very good. We're getting a lot of parallax measurements now. Thousands, many thousands. So it's pretty good. So Kepler, he's, he's got this eight minutes of arc, and he doesn't know what to do with it. And he, so what he did, getting back to Kepler, he's looking at, you know, just, you know, like, shelves in the library filled with paper and observations of all these planets and he's he's able to figure it out it's not circles it's ellipses and here's what he figured out the first of his laws that the orbit of each planet around the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. Now that's from page 67, chapter 3. And there's more about uh, Kepler's laws in chapter 4 a little bit. And we'll talk about that at the end of class. So let's take a look at the ellipse. I mean, the, um, the first part of it, go ahead and draw an ellipse. See if you can make your sketch the same as mine. As close to that, you know, same proportions. Okay, so in other words, don't make it look like a circle. Make it look obviously oblong, all right? And, you know, your PowerPoint or your Apple Keynote software will make an ellipse automatically inside of a square uh, really nicely. Now, the first part is the major axis, and that's the long axis. It's a symmetry axis. It's the same above that axis as below. They're kind of mirror images of each other. And the distance usually is expressed um, as two times the semi-major axis. So, um, so the semi-major axis is A. The entire major axis is 2A. 
minor axis, um, that is the vertical axis in this diagram. Okay, it's the shorter axis. It is a symmetry axis. And the symbol for that is 2B, the semi-minor axis being B, symbol B. And you may remember this from high school geometry class, uh, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. That's the equation for an ellipse on graph paper. Uh, the minor axis, so for this particular uh, ellipse, what I have drawn, uh, it is uh, 300 pixels by 200 pixels for A and B. So overall size, 600 by 400 pixels. Okay, that, so Matt, what this one does, it fits into a square, into a rectangle, 600 pixels wide and 400 tall. Okay. There are two focal points, or two foci, and there's a center. And the two focal points, one of them is where the sun is. Okay, and for this particular one, I measured it really carefully. It's, there's a little bit of trig in this. You don't have to worry about figuring out the position. I've got the position. Just try to copy my sketch in the right proportions, same as I do, as well as you can. And then you can look at it on YouTube if you want to really look at it again precisely. And there's another focus over here, symmetric left, left to right. So the, the minor axis, the vertical line in this sketch, uh, is a symmetry axis. The foci are symmetric left and right relative to that minor axis. Okay? They're on the major axis, and they're symmetric left and right. Now, Kepler, how he figured this out, I have no idea. Because the circles, I'll show you this on, on two, what's today, Thursday? Tuesday. Uh, the circles that he, or the ellipses that he were look, was looking at are so close to perfect circles. It is amazing that he could distinguish it, but he did. Uh, and he reconciled this eight minutes of arc. So he said, all right, all the planets, don't or they don't orbit on circles, they're on ellipses, and the sun is at one of the focal points. Now there's nothing else, there's nothing out here, that's just kind of a mathematical artifact. The physics is oriented to this one, all right, one of the focal points, okay? Now, the way that you construct, this is kind of a part of an ellipse, the way that you construct it with string is basically this, that the distance from F1 up to the ellipse and then back to F2 is a constant, and it's equal to 2A, the length of the major axis. Now, what do I mean by those distances? Well, here's an example, okay? These two red dashed line segments... Just go from focus F1 all the way up here to the top of the ellipse where the minor axis cuts through and then all the way back to F2. That red dashed line is going to be equal to 2A. And if you choose any other point, you know, if so if I choose this one up here in the northwest quadrant, and connect red dashed lines from F1 up to that point, and then from that point back down straight to F2, those distances add up to 600 pixels, 2A. So the distance here is 600 pixels. Okay, go ahead and jot that down. And if you have a different ellipse, you might have a different pixel count for that distance. But it's always... Um, the, the major axis, 2 times A. Now, what are the properties of an ellipse? Well, one of the properties of an ellipse is that it has an eccentricity. And there's a zillion properties. This is probably the most important one because, especially for astronomers, because they'll, they'll list like, you know, planets, uh, and you know, like the planets of the solar system, and they 
they make a list of, you know, it's mass, it's semi-major axis, it's eccentricity. You know, they last all the properties of that particular planet. It's physical properties like it's mass, um, and it's orbital properties like it's semi-major axis and it's eccentricity. Now, eccentricity is a little bit different, and we're going to give you an example of it in a minute. Um, for this particular ellipse that I've sketched out, 600 by 400, uh, the eccentricity is 0 0.745, and I'll give you the formula for that in a minute. Not that you're going to have to do a whole lot with it, but I want you to see it. And you'll see the Pythagorean theorem kind of sneaking in there. As a matter of fact, from this diagram with the red dashed lines, you can see Pythagorean theorem. You can see a right triangle in there. All right? And Pythagoras, man, he's everywhere. You know, it's kind of like that, like Forrest Gump. You know, Forrest Gump is everywhere. Same with Pythagoras. That's unbelievable. Anyway, so eccentricity 0 0.745. There's other factors, you know, like uh, circumference and area. There's, we, we have the area uh, and the circumference formulas. Ellipses, did you know that elli ellipses like this, they use these as part of the encryption software in various sum encryption algorithms. They use ellipses. I'm not going to tell you how it's done, but you can look it up. It's very difficult. Very, diff very arcane and difficult mathematics. Okay, uh, special points on the ellipse. First one is called perihelion. If it's an ellipse for something orbiting the sun, we call it perihelion. And what that means, para means above, or next to, and helion, that means helios, sun. Okay, so this is the point on the ellipse closest to the sun. All right, so go ahead and make a note of that. Perihelion, it's over here uh, on the small side of the ellipse, on the sun side. Now, all the way over here on the far side, that's got a special name too, and it's pretty important as well. It's called aphelion, A-P for ap, apo, away in Greek. Uh, the word apostle is someone who is sent, apostelene in Greek. Uh, and aphelion is the point away from the sun, the furthest point. Now, it, so this is for something in um, orbit around the sun. If you're talking about something... Uh, going around the Earth, the words are a little di bit different. This is the kind of stuff that you'll hear NASA talking about. Perigee, G, G-E-E, -E, as in geo, as in Earth. Apogee, the farthest point on the orbit. Perigee, the closest point to a closed orbit around the Earth. And... You know, NASA and, you know, the Department of Defense, they put up these satellites. And some of them, they just want on perfect circles. You know, so the, the perigee and the apogee are the same if you have circular orbits. You can make a, make a note of that. But a lot of times they want a, something with a really, really close perigee because what they do is they put a Hubble Space Telescope on an elliptical orbit where its perigee is looking right down the pipe of some Russian missile silo. So they can see that, you know, they can read the guy's ID cards in the middle of this uh, Russian missile base. Okay, that's what they do. You know, or whatever camera that they want to mount and look at the Russians or the, Ch you know, something in China or wherever they want to look, and hopefully not on us. You know, they're not supposed to be looking at us, only the Russians. Uh, that's what they do. So they, sometimes you want an elliptical orbit. And so perigee and apogee are, you know, kind of, what would you call it? Landmarks. It's not land, but, I mean, it's up in space, but you could call it a landmark uh, part of each orbit. And as I mentioned already, um, another property of a 
ellipse is that it has symmetries. It has left to right symmetry and it has up and down symmetry. You know, the, the up and down symmetry is with respect to the major axis of this one anyways. And then the left to right is left to right with respect to my minor axis for this example. Now let me pause for questions about this. Yes. See, I told you, it always works. It almost always works. 15 second rule. Ding. Okay, I got you over here too. I see your hand. Go ahead. He knew most of this, yeah. He, he, you know, I don't even want to think about how much scratch paper he went through. But, I mean, he knew all this stuff he knew. You know, and Sir Isaac Newton... You know, he put the, you know, the, 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 uh, f the, the icing on the cake for this. But the ancient Greeks knew all this. You know, they, I don't know if the ancient Greeks figured out eccentricity, but they knew all the basic, you know, relationships, all the Pythagorean theorem factors in here and stuff. So there's nothing new about this. This is, you know, by the time of Kepler, it was at least 2,000 years old, most of the knowledge of this, you know, from the time of the ancient Greeks. So... You know, he, but it's amazing. When I show you the actual orbits next to a perfect circle, you're going to be amazed that he could see him. Okay, you had a question over here. Wait a minute. First name. Tyro? Tyro. Good. No, we're going to measure eccentricity. We're going to measure semi-major axis and eccentricity for as many systems as we can. Yeah, because it, what Kepler found is this semi-major axis is pretty important. And in the third law, I'll show you exactly why that's important. All right, clicker question. Oh, one more question in the back. Go ahead. I can't hear you. Can you, can you say that again? Yeah, good question. It, it, for those guys, it was. But now we know, see, Galileo figured out that the Milky Way was, you know, just a big system of stars. And since the early 1900s, we've known that we're in a galaxy and that we're moving, or the sun is moving around the galaxy. But the sun is not moving that fast that it loses the planets. It's going slowly. It's, it's really whipping. But it's still moving slowly enough that it keeps everybody, you know, in orbit. It's kind of like... It's kind of like if you're on a flatbed truck and you're going at five miles an hour and you had some complex behavior like jump and rope, okay? And you had two people holding the rope and you, you go in and you start jumping um, and you come back out again and stuff. If you're five miles an hour, you can do that. At 200 miles an hour, probably not, and you probably wouldn't want to because if you fall off at 200 miles an hour, it's bad enough at five miles an hour, but, but anyway, so the speed factor for the sun is similar to that. It's going, but it's not going so fast that it's going to lose its planets. And there's no other planet nearby that's going to really, um, or there's no other star near enough to drag planets away. I mean, so, so, but that's, you know, that's definitely an issue, you know. And I'm sure there's other stars for which that's happened. Matter of fact, the moon, we think, used to be in a way different orbit and crashed into Earth um, and was captured by, you know, blew up, you know, left a lot of remnants on Earth and then and a lot of into space and then re-coalesced into a smaller sphere in the orbit that it has. So interactions can happen, but we don't think that's going to happen anytime soon uh, with the SUN. Another question? Yeah, up here, Matt. So you said that the sun was orbiting around the center of the planet. Right. How long does it take to make a full orbit around the planet? Many, many, many millions of years. It's a big galaxy. But we think that's, that's what we think. 
many millions of years. They think it's it's related to like the extinction of dinosaurs and, and you know big huge. The the Earth has had this you know they they've been able to analyze the geology of the Earth and um, and they know that many many millions of years ago the Earth was completely covered with ice, the ice ball. And now we're, we have a liquid ocean, or, you know, a huge amount of... Dude. You better... Better... Come on, man. Get that square away. Anyway, so... Uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's a really long orbit. Let's keep going. Uh, clicker question. You ready? Frequency AA. Let me start the question. And if you haven't had your clicker before yet, press and hold the power button. And then when you get the flashing square, type in the letters AA. And you'll be on my frequency. Now this is kind of a brain burner question. Do some thinking. A perfect circle versus, you know, a generic oblong ellipse. Ten seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, let's see what you guys got here. Right. Aha, look at this. This is interesting. We have a uh, kind of a smorgasbord of answers. A lot of you voted for A, 50, majority, 54%. So A just got elected. Uh, B, 29%. Uh, significant percentages over here. Nope, well, there's no E on this. Anyway, so you can't vote for that. Um, let me move this back out of the way. And uh, the answer is that a circle has no eccentricity. So if you voted for A, you are out of here. B is the exact. I see somebody in the back going, yeah. Um, so the, the sentence that you want to write down is a circle has no eccentricity. It's perfectly symmetric. There's not two symmetry axes. There's an infinity of symmetry axes. It's completely symmetric no matter what, what angle you look at it. But an ellipse, it's only you know, one angle. Uh, that you have um, symmetry. All right, so another way to look at this is to look at the formula for eccentricity. And it's pretty bodacious looking. The eccentricity E is equal to the square root of the quantity 1 minus B squared, semi minor, quantity squared, divided by A squared semi-major, quantity squared. Now, minor divided by major, semi-minor divided by semi, that's going to be a number less than 1. The square of it is going to be a number less than 1. 1 minus a number less than 1 is a positive number. And then the square root of a positive number is positive. So if if A and B are not exactly the same, you're going to have some kind of positive number. If A is infinity, um, if your ellipse is really, really wide and not very tall, you'll have a uh, square root of 1. But if you have a perfect circle, you have the square root of 0 because A and B are the same. So make a note of that. When we say that uh, the circle has no eccentricity, that's like saying that the semi-major and the semi-minor axis are the same size. 
That's what makes it a circle. It's perfectly symmetric in every angle instead of just two. Zero and 90 degrees. Now, we're not going to have to calculate too many eccentricities, but this is the one that you could, you know, for those, there are some of you guys that have had a lot of math. Raise your hand if you've had calculus class, by the way. Just show hands. See, there's a bunch of you that have had calc, so, you know, if you guys want to look at it, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting. And by the way, those of you that had, have had calc and trig, you see the Pythagorean theorem in there? It's actually, you see sines and cosines in there. That's, sin, that's actually sines and cosines. It's kind of interesting. Next question. This one you have to, uh, let's go back to this question here. Better write down your, uh, for, write down this formula. Okay. And you're going to calculate it for the next question. And then multiple choice the answer. All right. So uh, the square root of the quantity, 1 minus b squared over a squared. Right. Don't forget those squares. Pythagoras, he's everywhere. Just like Forrest Gump. Okay, for, a, for a zero for a circle, one for perfectly string strung out ellipse. Okay, comet X has semi major axis A equals five, semi minor B equals three. Calculate eccentricity. And let me start the question for you. And figure that out and go ahead and draw it. And if you don't have a, if you don't have a calculator, you better start bringing one uh, or at least ha have your cell phone. But on exam day, you're, you're going to have to have one if I ask you to do something like this. Which one is correct? Thirty seconds. Now eventually, I'll be giving you questions in which you actually type in the number instead of me giving you four choices. That'll be even tougher. This is new software, a new version of the software. It works a little differently, but we still, so I, I'm, I'm still getting used to it myself. But eventually, we'll be doing that. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Uh, questions before I terminate? Yes. Yeah, there'll be for there'll be a cover page with formulas, and either that or uh, there'll be a matching section with you know a formula here and a concept over here. And you okay, let's see what you guys got here. Oh man. Looks like there's a bunch of geniuses in here because C is correct. This is the right answer. Okay, so make a note of that. Um, and uh, you know, it's it'll be good. Now, the thing about this one, this particular diagram, do not be deceived. 
The sun is not at the intersection of the red and the blue line segments. That's the center of the ellipse, but the, the sun would be uh, somewhere off over here or over here on the ellipse, okay? Either one of those two foci, all right? Yeah, let's keep going. Okay, second law. Okay, first law. Uh, let me just point you out to this figure, 313. Um, we look at the YouTubes on extra, the, the extra readings page in web courses, and you can mess around with it. You know, entertain your friends and confound your enemies by drawing ellipses. Okay, second law is this. As a planet moves around its orbit, it sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And what that really means, I have no idea how he figured this out, but if it's basically, you know, taking um, little pieces uh, or little wedges of the orbit or of the, the disk and comparing it. So it's based on this concept that at perihelion, close to the sun, the planet is really moving going its fastest. But it's about to circle around the sun and then head out to the outer part of its orbit and slow down as it goes. And at aphelion, it is going its very slowest. Now that still may be fast for a planet, I mean, compared to, you know, terrestrial human velocities, but that, that part of the orbit would be the slowest. All right, now let's take a look at this up close. And we'll be adding to this. Okay, here's, so here's a typical orbit. This is figure 3.14. And here's the sun up here at this focus. Now there's nothing over here, as I mentioned before. Here's the semi-major. Okay, semi-minor is not drawn in. Um, and out here at perihelion, that's where it's going the fastest. And over here at aphelion, it's going the slowest. Because gravity is weaker, the further away you get, according to Sir Isaac Newton, the weaker gravity gets. So if it's weaker gravity out there, it can't accelerate anything very well. But down in here, uh, yeah, you can really accelerate stuff. All right, now here's the equal areas. All right. Think about like one month near perihelion, you sweep out this little wedge, you know, from the beginning of the month to the end of the month and then to the sun. That wedge bounded by the ellipse and then the two uh, location segments from the planet to the sun that form an angle, uh, that area is the same as one month uh, out here at aphelion or any other month. All right, so try to make a sketch of this. Okay, so this is like two months, you know, one uh, near perihelion, and you have a really wide piece of pie, but it's not very, it's not very tall. It's not, that's wide, but, it's, but the other one is really slivery, but it's really long, okay? And what, I have no idea how Kepler figured this out. And he didn't even have calculus. Nobody knew anything about calculus until after Kepler, you know, was gone. Sir Isaac Newton invented it. How he figured this out, I have no idea. I, I suppose somebody knows, but I should look it up one of these days. All right, so that's the equal areas law, second law of Kepler. And it encodes a pretty important fact about the force of gravity, as Sir Isaac Newton found later, that gravity is stronger when the distance is smaller over here at perihelion, and that the force is weaker out here at aphelion, where the distance to the sun is greater. Now, Kepler did know jack about gravitation. 
He was just working the geometry. And these rules are geometric. Although I guess, I guess he did time things out. So he did a little bit of timing. You know, in planets, you're talking about months and years. Some planets for many years. Uh, and they had all that figured out. But he didn't really have any hypothesis about what was keeping them. That was Sir Isaac Newton. He's the one that figured out the force of gravity, the same force that causes an apple to fall off an apple tree and conk you on the head is the same force that keeps planets in orbit. Side note, and you can think about this if you want. If the orbit were a perfect circle, you know, A equal to B, every angle symmetric, you know, giving you a symmetry angle, each 30-day period would sweep out an equal size Equal size and equal shape. Exact same. So you'd have a, you know, for the Earth's orbit, uh, 12 equal pieces of pi, and they'd be identical to each other. You know, 30 days, 30 days. Any 30-day period on a perfect circle, like for Earth, the Earth is so close to a perfect circle. Uh, and those pi slices look really, really identical. Now, I'll just give you a, another side note here think about it, it we'll talk more about it on Tuesday when we wrap this up and we start talking about planets in particular this particular ellipse it's pretty eccentric I'd say it's got an eccentricity of you know about 0.7 or 0.8 kind of like the one that I constructed for which I calculated eccentricity exactly Planets, there's not a single planet in our solar system with eccentricity anything like this. The only thing in our solar system with eccentricity like this are comets and, and a few asteroids. Comets and asteroids can have very high eccentricity. Planets are really close to perfect circles. Okay, so... In the textbook, we exaggerate this diagram of a planet's orbit. Uh, but in reality, the planet's orbits are all really hard to distinguish from a perfect circle, as you'll see on Tuesday. And this is figure 315 for those of you that are trying to keep notes. Kepler's third law. The best of all three. And this diagram is also from chapter 3. Here's, his, here's the third law of motion that he developed. That planets orbit the sun obeying the precise mathematical relationship P squared is equal to A to the third. The orbital period is P and the semi-major axis is A. And how he figured this out, you know, so the period has to, for the solar system, P has to be measured in years. So for Earth, it's one year. The semi-major axis has to be uh, measured in terms of the astronomical unit. And the astronomical unit is the exact size of Earth's orbit. Everything... In the solar system, we relate to Earth's orbit. Uh, and so we call that, uh, for proportionality purposes, one. You were in one of my classes before. No, not you. Two rows back. With a striped shirt. Yeah. You were in one of my classes before, right? Yeah. Was it this one or physical science? Ah, so you're still an engineering major? Right. Anyway, what major are you? I kept looking at you all day. I know that guy. I know that guy. I know that guy. And talking about Kepler's third law brought it all the way home. Anyway, so the astronaut, so the semi-major axis A has to be measured in. Uh, astronomical units. And what Kepler found is if you, if you measure the period of the orbit of Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, and if you square it, 
it equals exactly the third power of the semi-major axis of that planet. Now, here's the important part. Newton, mighty Newton, Sir Isaac von Newton, he nailed this one. His first three laws of motion and calculus allowed him to prove that in the theory of gravitation, the orbits are ellipses, that equal areas are swept out, and that this, for any astronomical system, is the Kepler's law that operates. Now, in the, in the solar system, I've got to tell you what these things are. Four pi, pi, you know what that is, 3.14, 1.5. Eight, blah, blah, blah. Uh, G, that's the gravitational constant, Newton's constant, in the law of gravitation. I'll probably show you that law on Tuesday. And then M1 and M2, that's the mass of each planet. Or if it's a star, it's the mass of both stars. And then here's the, here's the period, or here's the semi-major axis in any form you want to measure it astronomical units or light seconds or light years and here's the period and Sir Isaac Newton said this is what Kepler's law is about this is why it works and with this we could detect black holes and if you don't believe me just look at this dot you got your you got this formula down we're not G stands for the gravitational constant. I'll show it to you on Tuesday. This is a map. This ellipse that you see is a map of a star that we can see on infrared at the center of our galaxy. It is orbiting Sagittarius A star right there at the tip of my cursor. It's marked with a circle with a plus in it. The orbital period here is 15.2 years for this star. Now, here's, a, here's something uh, that's, that's a star orbiting a black hole. We can't see the black hole. We know where the center of it, we, we know where it is because we can figure out this ellipse. I mean, Plato and Aristotle could have figured out this, that location. But only Sir Isaac Newton can figure out the mass of this thing. 3.7 million times the mass of our star, the sun. And, and look at these years. They started mapping it in infrared in 1992. And here back in 2002, they published a paper. Yeah, we got it. We bagged it. We got the ellipse. And because we got the ellipse, we have the black hole. And they prove that there's a black hole at the very center of our galaxy right here. This is what it looks like in infrared. And they got it. 3.7 million times the max. And we've been looking at it ever since. We've got it, baby. And we think that every galaxy's got one. This is the one that we can see. There's a close-up. Look at this. Right down in here. There it is, right in here. We got it. We can't see it, but we know it's there, baby. All right, homework. I'll uh, be ready by lunchtime tomorrow. Do you on Tuesday? I'll see you later. Good day. You're excused.